I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we are leaving the Maoist wilderness. The darkness. I guess it's more of a brightness, really. Well, I mean, we're leaving the darkness. Right? We're leaving the brightness. Oh, that's right. Mao's brightness. The yeah. brightness of the sun. Yes. Yeah. Remember we talked about the the sort of lack of sleep in uh, that, that Professor Chan talks about in his book. Yeah. That, that Maoists don't sleep. They continue producing stuff for the state and for society. And if we'd really wanted to night. bore people, we could have talked about Lei Feng and how he idolized the truck. As a as sort of like this, if you're really going to be a, a great servant of the state, you should never rest. You should work all the time. But we did not want to bore you, and we. I think we probably our... still kind of bored them anyway. But it's hard to it's hard not to bore people when talking about the Maoist period. Agreed, agreed. But now we're actually in, I think, the most interesting period of the PRC, the 1980s. Yes, at least for literature and the arts. So this is part nine of our ten part series. A hundred years of Chinese literature coming to the end. Um, yeah, the nineteen eighties is is fascinating because uh, I, well, it, it tends to get idealized quite a bit, not without reason. Uh, because once Mao dies in seventy six, and certainly a couple of years later when Deng Xiaoping takes over, uh, things start to change pretty fast. And there's a period of time when you can kind of write stuff you wouldn't have been able to write before. And publish things you wouldn't have been able to publish before. So there's a lot more experimentation, a lot more overt nods to Western literature than would have been possible in the Maoist era. Yeah, I think we did an episode on Tan Shui and her hut in the mountain, which she is very much uh, uh, drawing off of Kafka and some other Western forms. This, you know, like I, I uh, read a... Uh, I read a dissertation by a, a good friend and a scholar of mine, Ray Wong, Ray Kunze Wong, who's in Germany now. Um, but she wrote uh, her dissertation about Heidze, and I was just amazed by how much discussion of Hegel and all of these other Western philosophers there were amongst the intellectual class that Heidze was kind of floating around in. There's, there's, there's just so much kind of uh, communication with Western literature going on in the 1980s. That you, I when I was living in China, I never felt like I could talk about any of that. Not, I mean, I you know, I, I'm not an expert on it, but I couldn't, I couldn't have those discussions. So let's, you know, the 80s is a very eventful decade, but let's see if we can give folks a bit of a historical foundation here for what's happening. Mao dies, Deng Xiaoping takes over. Not. Quite well, I know not like the next day, sure, like the next two years he takes over, yeah. Um, and then Dung Dung starts to systematically take apart basically all the stuff that Mao was doing. Mao dies 1976, Dung sort of begins to take power in 77, 78, really kind of grabs hold of the reins of powers in 70, power in 79, and uh, the 80s is a decade of of experimentation, not only in, in terms of writers like we've been talking about, but also in terms of politics. This is really the most open decade politically, economically, and in terms of literature. And I think that the literature feeds off that openness. That is one of the reasons why you have all of these writers from outside of China kind of entering China in terms of their works, not necessarily that they're not physically getting on a plane and going to China. Uh, I don't think Kafka... <laughs> <laughs> flew to China. But you do have uh, a lot of these writers, kind of their their books circulating in China, which makes for a fascinating decade. Um, it's my favorite decade in the history of the, the PRC, hands down, by far. Uh, in terms of just the sort of hope, uh, there are a lot of problems, but really I can't think of a more hopeful decade and, and I think that bleeds sort of into the literature, the kind of, the, it's just really interesting literature. I mean, we, we struggled when we were talking about the 1960s and 1970s with finding any literature that could qualify as as literature. But uh, Here we're spoiled for choice. It's, it's kind of hard because I, I really have like two or three writers who I want to choose. And in the end, I landed on Han Xiaogong. Han Xiaogong is a novelist, short story writer. Uh, some of his most famous works are Ba 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 and uh, uh, you know, several other uh, 
weird kind of short stories, Gui Chi Lai, uh, which is, is in English, homecoming. So he, Han Zhao Gong is a sent down youth. He was born in the 1950s. He uh, grows up completely under, under Maoism. Uh, in the late 60s or early 70s, I'm not sure when, he became a sent down youth, which is just in, in, in the Cultural Revolution. Mao, when he, he first asked the youth to kind of stand up and rebel and overthrow the state and help him take back power, but then he realized that the youth weren't quite exactly controllable and so he took them and and sent them down to the countryside to be educated by the, the real beating heart of communism he's like yeah. you know the problem here everybody is not that you're not enthusiastic enough and all that it's that you know you really need to get back in touch with the right people and and, and that of was course really... the right people being hundreds and thousands of miles away from all the cities, basically. And, and that was really more of a political move, although he couched it in ideological terms. But Han Gong went down to the countryside. He labored, and then he came back up. And he, in the 1980s, writes these really, really strange uh, short stories and novels. I, the one that I think is my favorite is Ba Ba Ba. It. Very it's strange. A, yeah, uh, we. I think we did a podcast on we it, did. didn't we? Yes, we did. Um, so ba 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 is really just in English pa pa pa, right? Like ba ba is is the word papa in English. Um, not not that they're derived from the same thing, but but they're related. Uh, they, they mean the same thing. Uh, and uh, it's a story about a boy who can only say two things: pa pa pa. And F mama, F being something we can't say on the podcast, right? Without uh, getting a little E next to the podcast. <laughs> um, and so you have this child who's handicapped. He grows up in a village, uh, and he eventually kind of becomes the leader of the billi- village. He, the The village kind of takes him as a mascot or something. Mascot, but also like a, a, a kind of seer um when he's actually just mentally you know handicapped uh and, and it's just this weird mythical village that kind of evokes this chineseness but also it it draws off of uh shen song wen who i don't think we've done a podcast we on. haven't because neither of us is a huge fan of shen song wen. that's right yeah um but he is very important in terms of chinese yes, literature and so. so han Chao gong they're both from hunan uh, which is a kind of interesting part of China. It's it's uh, it's kind of uh, on the edge of of like the core of China, uh, and both of these writers, uh, Shen Tongwen and Han Xiaogong, are kind of drawing off of their Hunanese heritage as like this is both the like epitome of traditional China and a place that's kind of on the edge. Han Chao Gong is just a fascinating figure. You can, his works have been translated into English. You can, you can read him, uh, in, uh, uh, in some translations that we'll put into the, the, onto the website, uh, and, and kind of use his show notes. Rob. Well, hang on me before, before I can do mine, I wanted to comment on, on, on yours as well. Yeah, go for it. It's one of the things that's interesting about writers like Han Chao Gong and frankly, a lot of others is, that they are taking some of the things that had been done in the Maoist era and just throwing them into the shredder, right? So writing about a remote village full of people who are weak, taken advantage of, or bad They're things happen to dumb, them, right? right, whatever, however you want to put it, the villager as the center of Chinese literature is, is very old and is like the key to Maoist literature. The difference here is that someone is crafting avant-garde art out of the villager. Uh, one of the biggest influences on fiction in that era, for a while anyway, was William Faulkner. Because a lot of Chinese writers got a hold of Faulkner and went, whoa, this is somebody writing about backwoods rural folk in very strange avant-garde ways. This is really interesting. And so that spreads. It's it's not just Faulkner. So I, I definitely agree. You can see shades of Faulkner in Han Xiao Gong, but I think more... Gabriel Garcia Marquez, for yes. example, 100 Years yeah, of Solitude. So, yeah, so I was going to say it's kind of like a magical realist text. Not all of Han Xiao Gong's works are that way, but certainly Ba 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 is... 
you have this kind of like jumpiness of time, like you have this kind of mythic village space. It's just all very weird and yet so very modern too. Mm -hmm. Which which is a good way of describing the 80s in general. People are just throwing stuff out there to see what happens because, as you mentioned earlier, with, with the opening up reform and opening up Deng Xiaoping's initiative, uh, simply hearing, you know what? It's okay if you make money would have fried people's brains coming out of the Cultural Revolution. Like, wait, hold on. I personally am allowed to go make money from a, a Western company with capitalists? Are you kidding me? And just yeah, that... that was verboten in the 1970s. Absolutely. I mean, you, you could get killed for having done that. For having done that decades earlier. Yeah, so now that that's cool, writers who have always wanted to do stuff like this are... There's just this explosion of pent up energy, and Han Shaogong is one of the people who you you see coming out of that. And there's an explosion of kind of wanting to have this dialogue with the West, but simultaneously there is this turn towards Chineseness. So uh, Han Shaogong is part of the Shungun movement, the root seeking movement that kind of tries to find the roots of some sort of Chinese national essence. Now, I'm not making the argument that there is such a thing, but these writers were struggling to kind of get at that. Um, and Han Xiaogong is definitely in, in locating Ba 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 in this mythic space. He's definitely going for something like trying to find some sort of core element, some essentialist notion of Chineseness. And my, the writer I'm picking who I is almost an obvious choice in some ways comes out of a similar school, the root seeking movement. And that's Haidze. Uh Haidze is, We've done a podcast or two on Haidze as well, but um, is one of the only poets in modern China uh, who you will find most people knowing at least something about and to have had at least one or two of his poems memorized. He is a practically mythical figure. Everybody reads him in high school. Everybody. Um, he's sort of the tortured genius dead at a young age he killed himself at the age of 25 he's very much like a kind of romantic shelly yeah. byronic figure um writing a biography about him it would be almost impossible unless you can get his closest friend and uh fellow poet Xi Chuan, who's still writing today to talk about him uh because he didn't he didn't join any major movements he didn't do anything amazing he just wrote tons of poetry and then in 1989, several months before the crackdown in Tiananmen Square, he laid down on the train tracks in the countryside near his home with a bag of books next to him that contained Contiki, the Bible, and a copy of Conrad, and let himself be run down by a train. What Conrad was he reading? I don't remember. Yeah. At least I think it was Conrad. I'm pretty sure it was Conrad. But I mean, he made this kind of romantic. Yeah, that's such a classic gesture. sort of like, yeah, throwing yourself off a cliff with your copy of the, the Greek poets or something like that. Um, he is still revered as sort of China's pure poet, someone who didn't publish his stuff in his lifetime, someone who didn't try to make money, someone who sort of was a mystic, sort of traveled the land reading odd works of philosophy. He was incredibly brilliant. Um, and we have a lot of his poetry still. A lot. Yes. And, and it, you know, the, the stuff that people read today in high school is like the, the very short poems. But he actually wrote like very long mythical narrative poems that go on for hundreds of pages, right? That, yes. that kind of are... are guano crazy right well this is one of the crazy things about him is that um if you you know i wrote my master's thesis on this in, in china but if dun, dun, dun. i know right in chinese it was brutal um Ooh. yeah thank god my tutor was there to help me correct on my grammar mistakes but um when you when you when you do research on Haidza in China, if you just look up the article database, there's thousands and thousands of articles and books written about him. There's nothing on him in the West. You mentioned Ray Kunza earlier; she's written a book on Haidza. Um, there are, I believe, two very short collections of his poetry in English. Uh, that's it. Now that's interesting because he's he has such massive stature in China. You would expect something comparable to exist in the West, but it doesn't really. Why do you think that is? That's a good question. I, I, I'm not entirely do, sure. Can I ask, do you think that Haidza translates out of Chinese? Poem? Well, no, but you could also argue that 
like you know, there's another fellow poet from that era, Ouyang Jianghe, uh, who is just as incredibly hard to read and translate. Well, in some ways, more so. And there's yeah, many so. translations of his stuff. Xi Zhuan really? also. Oh yeah. Huh. Well, compared to Haiza, sure. Anyway, uh, why is Haiza so renowned? Um, if you look at the complete collection of his works, and I'm going to get to his long stuff here in just a second. I'm not going to talk Ooh, about it too geez. long because people are going to get bored. Um, <laughs> uh, it's the, the same kind of thing you would expect from any sort of collected, unedited works by a great writer. There's some genius pieces and there's some things where you're like, what is going on here for real? Um, the best example of the latter is even in China, almost nobody writes about his sort of long experimental stuff. It's it's super. He trippy. basically he's got a set, what he was intending to be a seven part epic called the Seven Books of the Sun, uh, that was basically going to be a, a poetic history of everything that has ever been forever. Uh, the very first section of the work uh, starts off with the separation of the continents. <laughs> Literally, you know, I mean, it's that it's that kind of thing. Um, it's almost impossible to even start talking about it, but, um, it is intended to be, it's intended to be like, look, what if the entire world was just poetry? What if I just made like a poetry world entirely? And that's what this was, right? That's kind of his attempt that the real world was something dark and difficult. So what if I just boiled all of that down into a poetic work that I just lived in? That's sort of the... That's sort of what happens when you read it. You get this this feeling of somebody trying to build their own version of the world in miniature, and that's that's it, you know. Um, now, poetry's great, but he kills himself several months before the Tiananmen Square massacre. March 26th, 1989. Yep. So the parallels are obvious, right? So the democracy movement in China rises up. Uh, students are marching... You know, a decade or so earlier, they would have been Maoist Red Guards. Now you have the exact opposite, people marching for democracy and reform. There's this huge upswell of optimism. Uh, Haidze is producing some of his most famous works at the same time. Mm -hmm. Sort of an emblem of, I'm not even going to, I don't even need to talk about politics at all. I'm just going to write poetry. Of course, that's still a very political stance, but... What's interesting, so Ray Kunza Wong, who we've talked about a couple of times on this podcast already, her argument is that one of the reasons that he is so popular is because he is this figure from the 1980s who is incredibly interesting, like so many other writers in the 1980s. But because he killed himself just before the democracy movement, he becomes politically safe. Uh, and so the regime can kind of put him in textbooks. And because he didn't he didn't do anything and during the Tiananmen Square protest, you know, it's not that there's less of a political danger in, in putting him in the, the, the textbook. Yeah. As a quote unquote, pure poet, everyone's allowed to read him. Uh, he is not nailing his poems to a board the way Bei Dao and Manke were about 12 years earlier in 76, 77. He's simply writing them and stashing them away until they're found. Right. Um, and so in this way, he sort of is this classic remote figure. I'm reading a, a, a long essay by, by his friend and, and poet, Sichuan, about the, the, the lingering Haidza imitator phenomenon. He said he would regularly get people coming into his office, like starry-eyed, you know, dressed in grimy clothes. I haven't slept for a week. I've been contemplating the stars like Haidza once did. And he <laughs> just goes, ugh, no, no, no. Uh, but it, there is this very much this like, I'm going to be like Thoreau. I'm going to be like Shelley. I'm going to go off and just experience life to the full, you know? How much do you think, because I mean, Haidza did that kind of stuff, Yeah, absolutely. Right? But how much do you think that the it, it's silly for these people coming into to Xichuan or Beidao's office and and doing this, how do you actually think it's silly or is it just silly because it's already been done before it, and they're just imitating? I think Sichuan wasn't saying it was so much silly. That's sort of my offhand reading of it. Sichuan was, was more worried than anything else. Like, I understand sort of your reverence for this, but this is also the thing that partly led to the death of my close friend 
I don't find it endearing or cool. Um, it's not endearing and cool. It's actually can be very dangerous if you're not. And there's also, as with any great uh, martyr for an art form that has their imitators, a lot of the imitators are missing some essential component. They're just sort of, if I'm grimy and gross and trying to write poetry, I'm just like Heidze, as opposed to actually being able to, for example, read and comment on Holderlin and Hegel competently was a part of Heidze's legacy. Can I ask, how much do you think that the the just mythologization of Heidze has made him into this figure and that he's not really all that different from these other people who are kind of imitating him. No, I, I, in some ways, in some ways that's true. I think I would, I mean, having never read poems written by some of the imitators, I can't really compare. Um, I've read a lot of Heidze's poems and they are very strange and unique. Um, what's your favorite Heidze poem? I don't have a favorite single poem. I mean, we haven't mentioned his most famous poem. This is by far his most famous poem. It's Mian Chao Da Hai Chun Nuan Hua Kai. Um, facing the sea, the spring uh, blossoms are opening up. The warm spring blossoms are opening up. What do you think of that poem? This it's is okay. the poem that is in See, every textbook. I always prefer the weird stuff. This, you would. I, I do. I, I love the, the long poems for that because... The one where the sun is like dancing and all of that. Oh, there's much weirder stuff than that, like lakes of blood and, you know, all kinds of stuff. But partly because some of these shorter poems, you, you, you can find close cousins in the era. Like, you can go, well, it feels a little bit like this or a little bit like that. His long poems feel like nothing. Uh, you read those and you, you mean go, they feel where like is this coming else. from? Yeah, nothing else. That's what I meant. You know, where is this? Th- In fact, that's what I read first of Heidze. I got his collected works when you I was You read a the long stuff before you read the short I stuff? I didn't read all. I mean, I didn't finish the long stuff. But um, I had already read a lot of Chinese poetry when I discovered Heidze. Or when I was, I started grad school in, in, at Nankai University in Tianjin and my classmates were like, oh, who are you going to write about? And I was like, oh, I don't know, these people. And they kept talking about Heidze. I was like, who is that? And they just looked at me with this shocked expression, like, what? You're doing Chinese literature? You don't know who that is? And I was like, uh, no. So they were like, come with us. We're getting his, we're getting you his collected works. You're, you're doing this now. But I actually flipped towards the back of the book and because I saw the line links. And I was like, what is going on back here? And I started reading it and went, wait, what? We're starting with the beginning of the world? What's this floating skull doing? Why is there, like, it just floored me. I was like, I've never seen this in Chinese literature. Uh, Somewhat the same as when you were talking about Han Shaogong. There's this, where is this coming from? This is so weird, but not so weird in a gratuitous way. Like, you're just doing this to mess with us. There, There seems to be some intent and purpose behind it, even if it's not totally well thought out. And I think that's a good good connection. The 1980s in China is weird. It's very weird. Uh, maybe like if, if you were going to 1980s China, I'm sure when you got into the Beijing airport, there was a sign, keep the 1980s weird. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or bumper stickers. <laughs> um, if they had had cars, they would have had bumper yeah, stickers. Yeah. But Bicycle uh, stickers. <laughs> um, but that's one of the things that I think is so fascinating about this this decade is... is <clears throat> You know, I, I've seen this critique of of the 1980s as a generational thing, that it's this neoliberal turn across the world, in the U.S., in the U.K., in China, everywhere. And I, I think that, you know, my association uh, with American literature and American society is much less charitable, like the the economics and politics of the 1980s in in China and the literature in China are all so cool and they're all so f- weird and and like there isn't this kind of drive to conformity that you might associate with some of the similar a similar kind of economics going on in the US and in the UK mm-hmm. and um it's not necessarily super popular a lot of this stuff we're not talking about bestsellers just flying off the show is popular not in his not in his era yeah yeah sorry sorry now he is but no one even knew who he was when he died sure um but one of the things to, to keep in mind with this is we haven't talked a lot about the democracy movement and we don't have time um but this stuff all comes up together right this turning turning out to the world saying hey we're here to make money again 
uh, liter- you know, writers and artists and filmmakers going, hey, we sure would like to write more like T.S. Eliot and William Faulkner and Gabriel Garcia Marquez and, and direct films that feel more like Fellini and stuff like that. All of a sudden, it all comes up at once suddenly, explosively, which is one of the things that makes the decade so weird and interesting. But like any explosion, things kind of settle and dissipate. Uh, and of course, the thing that of course makes them dissipate is the Tiananmen Square massacre. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is. I have to. This is going to be one of my closing thoughts, and you can jump in here. Um, it is very hard to to summarize or even fully appreciate the impact this had on intellectuals, artists, and people like that. In particular, the, you're talking about Tiananmen. Yeah, the Tiananmen Square massacre because. The people involved in the democracy movement, the people involved in these artistic experimentations, there was just this massive inertia. People were saying, this is it. We are taking, Mao's gone, Deng is sort of opening things up. We're going to force the door all the way open and make China what it's supposed to be. Tiananmen Square slams the door shut, completely shut. And all of a sudden people go, well, was that it? Was that like our moment? Like, how do we deal with this? We had this great moment, and now it's gone? Yeah, Han Xiaogong kept writing. Haidza obviously did not. Um, but there, there is this sense that, that everything changed in June of 1989, and the, the sort of magic of the 1980s, it, you don't get it back. You don't get it back, and it's not connected to anything anymore, the literature and the arts are. There's this sense, like when, when Lu Xun is writing in the, the teens, and when people like... His brother Zhou Zoren, Hu Shi, and others are writing. There's a sense of we're crafting literature that's a part of things that are changing the world. And the 80s felt that way too. My poetry, my films, whatever, are, are a part of a movement that is going to change China. Well, uh, it didn't. At least not the way that people envisioned. So does that mean it's useless now? Is, or should we just stop? Like, what's the point of this anymore if it's not connected to anything? It's a... Guanggun, it's a uh, an, a branch that just kind of ends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not to, that's a, that's a perfect way to put it. And I think that's a good place. Sad to also place in to the end podcast. It, but <laughs> <laughs> as a as perhaps a uh, this podcast is perhaps its own Guanggun. Yeah, indeed. All right, I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.